Well, it's our first day, and so <clears throat> I'm not quite sure uh, when everyone is here, how many people we might uh, know is the full complement, but I think we're very close. It's wonderful, as always, to see all of your faces appearing. <clears throat> it's when we get to 25 or 26, that'll be... Okay, I thought that was sort of our, uh, our target number, but I wasn't sure. We might not have Sue. She was getting um, her vaccine this morning. Okay. Uh, but we'll be, we would be 25 with everyone. Okay, great. We can certainly make a, a gentle beginning here. Um, <clears throat> you may notice um, a good bit of background noise uh, f from, from me. Um, I am on retreat with you. Um, I'm on retreat in a small cabin on the grounds of Hui Holana, which is uh, formerly called a retreat center, which we have used. Some of you have been here, uh, and I've I've taught here for gosh, 22 years. Of course, it's closed right now, and it's very close to my home. And so I've come to this little cabin to be in retreat during the day, when, um, during my day. Um, but there's a quite a, um, a robust storm happening. Uh, probably the most strong winter storm we've had uh, late. Uh, the, the winds are sustaining into the 20s and gusting up over 30 and close to 40 and uh, raining a bit. And the sun is just now coming up here. So I'm looking out over the, the ocean and watching the sun begin to appear through the clouds and the, the rain going sideways. It's a miracle, isn't it? That we have electricity and we have this kind of connection, and I see Claudine all the way in Switzerland. And <clears throat> at East Coast, the middle continental United States, West Coast, all the way out here. What time is it anyway? In some ways, it's the perfect situation for us to begin to approach this cl classical and classically um, <laughs> difficult for a lot of people, a uh, piece of writing by Dogen, Uji, or Being Time. One of the lovely things about <clears throat> this uh, retreat and the way we're uh, managing it is because we have a relatively, I say relatively, relatively small number of people um, I mean, we can see most of our faces uh, almost on one screen. Uh, not quite, but almost. And I don't know about many of you, but so many of the meetings on Zoom in this last year have gotten quite large. So many people can come. Uh, so it's nice that we have the blessing of time this week, and these numbers of people uh, to be together on our own, in time, being together.
So time seems to be passing. We come together on time. This past year of pandemic has passed, and yet it continues. As we continue being at this time, today we begin stepping aside from ordinary time to enter retreat, fully being the time of the schedule and the retreat as time goes on. In many ways, it seems like there's no time at all. And yet, it also feels as if it's opening in front of us and and fading behind us forever. This infinite expanse just now, in this moment. Can we use this precious time well? Who will we become during this time? Will the fullness of our being unfold in time or is it already here now? at this time? And if so, who or what has arrived or or not? Do you choose to be here now at this time? Can you meet the parts that don't want to be here. Because inviting them invites your being here more fully. And I could go on. This is a way I was just reflecting this morning more, um, I guess, simply and almost most like poetically, but just deepening my own feeling of the time being. And I noticed that all these statements and questions really relate to presence, human presence and everyday practice, which is no other than being. Uji, the term that Dogen used, is now. And we realize that now there's only Uji, there's only being time. You've already entered the retreat, you know, through our schedule and through our forms. They're the kind of portals that, that bring us into retreat. And these are even more important when we are online and not in some, uh, excuse me, in the same embodied space held together by each other's presence in time, being together. And how do we maintain the practice container? Is is a real question you'll be living with all week. Our forms and the willingness to follow them uh, as much as we um, engage them in this format allows us to see our lives and in some ways the lives of those around us even if it's in these small openings. So even at a great distance over this medium we find ourselves reflected back to ourselves in some ways even more so in Zoom because we actually see our own faces. And we have the intimate opportunity to see each other 
and even into each other's lives, we see maybe into a more intimate space than we might if they were just sitting on a cushion next to us in a zendo. Being together in time. Uh, Pegger, I might say more about this at some point. I, I don't want to really go into the academics of it at the moment, but um, some of you might know, I'm, I'm sure um, I would see David Hobson's head shaking if I said that Dogen's view in Uji is uncannily close to that of the great Western philosopher Heidegger, <clears throat> writing about being always being time, only being in time. Time is nothing other than being very similar kinds of, of writings, which we don't need to go into at the moment, but it's, it's kind of uncanny and, and kind of lovely when you see these things reflected. But you know, this turns out to be less a philosophical than an experiential fact. And this is some of why it's, it's important. Um, it's not important that we give you some intellectual teaching of philosophy um, about time and about being, or unpack uh, Heidegger's um, arguments or, or Dogen's so much, but to penetrate what's being offered in a way that assists us and assists us with others in moving through our lives in a way that calls forward more compassion, more wisdom, uh, our practice. <clears throat> so this is experiential and it's personal and it's practical, even though it may seem at times difficult to understand, but that edge where understanding can't fully hold is part of what makes this a spiritual practice and not an intellectual or philosophical one. We step over the line into not knowing, but with intimacy, with wonder and a willingness to continue without trying to nail something down. to really live, to really live these teachings and to accept that you live for the time being and to fully enter this moment of time. Living our life is that, not building up an identity or a set of accomplishments or relationships. So of, of course, you know, we do that but <clears throat> primarily, fundamentally, being, being is to live, which is to embrace each moment as if it were the first, last, and all moments of time. <clears throat> Whether you like or appreciate this moment is not the point. In fact, liking it or not liking it, um, appreciating it or not, being willing or unwilling to accept it, depending on whether you like it or not, is to sit on the fence of your life, waiting to decide whether or not to live. And in some ways, not actually living. It's so um, common for us to be tentative at times about, about the times of our lives to, or so um, I may be deeply asleep or distracted within it and you know, missing the whole thing. It's, this is not news. <laughs> we all experience this at times. But, but the deeper point and one I can remember my teacher, Blanche, speaking to me about more is that we actually don't know 
what it feels like to be alive so much of the time. I mean, we know about our problems and our desires and our goals and our accomplishments, our struggles, our yearnings, um, challenges. We know about that stuff. But do we actually know about our life? We think these things are our life. And of course, in, in some ways they are. They're the unfolding contents of lived experience. But it generally, my experience is that it generally takes a huge event, you know, the equivalent of birth and death, to wake us up to the sense of living, to really living this moment we are given. This moment that is just for the time being because it's passing even as it arrives. And our zazen practice is settling and embodying the feeling of being alive for the time being. Zazen is the practice of settling in to the embodied practice of feeling of being alive for the time being. Life is, you know, it's so much more poignant than we know on a daily basis. Maybe we can't allow ourselves actually to feel it fully, it'd be a bit much. But in retreat, can we tolerate meeting our lives and ourselves this intimately? Meeting each other so, um, I, I would say in some ways nakedly, outside of time yet fully being present to this time now. I know that these ways of speaking may sound unusual, but it's necessary in, in some ways. There was a, a poem by Dogen where he writes, all this visible springs from causes intimate to you. All that's visible springs from causes intimate to you. While waking, sitting, lying down, the body itself is the complete truth. If someone asks you the inner meaning of this, inside the treasury of the Dharma eye, a single grain of dust, everything that's visible springs from causes intimate to you while waking, sitting, lying down. The body itself is the complete truth. If someone asks you the inner meaning of this, inside the treasury of the Dharma eye, a single grain of dust, everything that's visible, everything that you can become aware of, springs from a cause that's intimate to you, that's not separate. You're embodied in this reality, and this reality moves with you and as you and through you. And the body itself is complete. It's, it, as you read through Dogen, it's, it sounds all philosophical and, and complicated at times, but it's incredible how it's focused on the body. And our practice is very grounded in the body. This, this is it. In our eye, in your eye, in every one of your eyes, you have Dharma vision. You have the capacity, and you are seeing how here. Okay, you got it. Seeing a grain of dust. Oh, I see that the storm is making my internet a little wonky. Sorry. Just wave like that if things go strange. The internet has a single grain of dust in it, or more right now. <laughs> this, this grain of dust bit, you know, is a metaphor for just a little bit of habit, a little bit of conditioning just enough of our automatic, habitual, conditioned self that 
you see yourself as separate. Me over here, the world out there. And entranced by that belief. And at the same time, you can feel that everything that arises comes from a cause intimate to you. But retreat helps us practice this intimacy, this way of being, and appreciate our actual lives more fully at this time. When you hear these these kind of phrases, um, all this visible springs from causes intimate to you, we're going to unfold that a little more throughout the week, including that you both have and are using the true Dharma eye right now, and that Dharma eye is also has dust at the same time. There's a, there's a segment in, in Dogen's writing called Dharma Blossoms Turn Dharma Blossoms, where he says, when you see a speck of dust, it's not that you do not see the world of phenomena. When you realize the world of phenomena, it's not that you do not realize a speck of dust. When Buddhas realize the world of phenomena, they do not keep you from realization. Wholesomeness is manifest from the very beginning, middle and end. Thus, realization is reality right now. Even shock, doubts, fears and frights are none other than right now. So this is, you know, Dogen's unusual way of speaking. Bottom line, you, everything's offered to you right now. This is it. Your body, both your wisdom and the dust, is the fullness of being to which we wake and which we can use and be used in our bodhisattva way for the benefit of all beings. And as we enter um, retreat, uh, there's, there's a way in which often we'll talk about setting an intention. Um, and I found an interesting thing. Dogen says, when, when the Buddhas, each having received one-to-one -one transmission of the splendid teachings, experienced awakening, they possess a subtle method which is without intention. They possess a subtle method which is without intention. And of course, they're speaking about when Buddha's having received the transmission and awakened. But I, I think he's suggesting in some ways that as we enter retreat, when we're intimate with the causes that give rise to what's going on right here, when we begin more intimate with ourselves, with our practice, that sometimes setting up a bunch of personal intentions probably takes something away. It can be a little bit of a distraction. Just be present at this time, maybe there's no other intention needed than the fullness of being itself in time. And you could argue if you're trained as a cognitive psychologist like, like I was, that you are intentionally being here, of course, you signed up, you made an intention, and, and that's true, but Dogen is suggesting something else in, as we enter a retreat. He's saying that when your heart is open, when you're actually present with these faces, you aren't following some external intention, but instead the vulnerable, robust intimacy of the moment. And this will be an interesting thing to explore in time, being. And so what is it that we're to explore? Intimacy. Meeting intim intimately. You know that you've heard me many, many times, and you've heard Peg also, we, we speak about Dogen's um, teaching about um, only a Buddha and a Buddha. This, this kind of intimacy. Because he's very clear that when we awaken, when we meet, we're meeting with that sort of true dharma eye to true dharma eye, Buddha to Buddha. But there's another little warning label here as we enter retreat I wanted to make mention of. 
This meeting is not from the outside. What I mean by that is, I think most of us, if we're honest, come to practice waiting for the Buddha to manifest and to arrive from out there and come meet us. I'm this lowly person and I want to meet a Buddha. You may think, I have this miserable life, my job sucks, the pandemic is going on forever, when is the Buddha going to come? You know, some, some version of that. I can't believe I have to go visit my family again and take care of, you know, whatever it is. As if the door of awakening opens from the other side somehow. But what Dogen is saying is, ah, when you're fully here, When you can see the other as Buddha, then by do, doing so, you manifest Buddha. When you see the other and you realize Buddha, you're manifesting Buddha. Instead of, instead of trying to become a Buddha, see the Buddha in the other person, then you're a Buddha. And Dogen is saying awakening can only be possible when there is a Buddha and a Buddha. But if I'm waiting for the Buddha, then I'll never really see the Buddha. I'm sure you must have done this. Um, where you're like waiting for somebody else to change so you can feel better. Anybody ever done that? <laughs> you know, maybe a relationship, maybe a marriage, maybe a child, maybe a work. You know, if they change, maybe I'll be happy. You're maybe your boss at work or like, when are you going to change so that I can really appreciate you or hoping your parents will change over those things they did in the past, the things that finally be set right, but the door of awakening opens from the inside. It's not waiting. I have couples come in for counseling where they I began to realize their invitation is for, you know, I'll be okay once you change. But it, it happens on the other side. The person who taught me, um, my main professor in family therapy, he said, you know, the person who comes in complaining about the family has to change first and the most. Now that's a very practical systems kind of thing, but it, it kind of it kind of reminds me of Rumi. You've, you've all heard this one probably. Rumi said, I've lived on the lip of insanity, wanting to know reasons, knocking on a door. It opens. I've been knocking from the inside. Or the great uh, Christian mystic Meister Eckhart, the eye through which I see God is the same eye through which God sees me. Just bringing it very, very much, much closer. So entering without too much structure of intention but offering ourselves fully intimacy, not waiting, being in time, seeing the other as Buddha so that our Buddha nature manifests. Can we read Dogen, these complicated, interesting things, as if he's come to offer you healing? That he's working to touch the part of ourselves that can't be reached by ordinary meaning. He's taken this on. He said, I'm going to reach you in a place that ordinary meaning won't reach you. It's what he calls in some of his other fascicles, non-thinking. You read Dogen. It says what it says. But it's a good idea not to worry too much about what it means the first time you go through. Just go forward and read it. Just plunge in and let it move through you. Let it come to you. Allow meaning to arrive. Just between you and Dogen. 
a Buddha and a Buddha. And for those of you who have read and studied Dogen quite a bit, I know some of you have, you know that there is something that is absolutely reliable about him in his writing. The first sentence of the first little bit tells you the whole thing. And then he says a lot more. But the first thing in every piece is, you know, summarizes the whole thing. And if you have uh, your, your copy of Uji with you somewhere, you don't have to look at it, but um, do it if you want. That first bit does that. And the first bit I mean by, I'll, I'll read it. An ancient Buddha said, from the time, for the time being, stand on top of the highest peak. For the time being, proceed along the bottom of the deepest ocean. For the time being, three heads and eight arms. For the time being, an eight or sixteen foot Buddha. For the time being, a staff or whisk. For the time being, a pillar or lantern. For the time being, the sons of Zhang and Li. For the time being, the earth and sky. For the time being, here means time itself is being and all being is time. What the heck? Most of the time when you're walking through your lives, you know, you're thinking, I want this, uh, but I don't want that. This is important, but maybe not that so much. This relates to me, not that, on and on. <clears throat> For the time being, stand on the top of the highest peak. For the time being, proceed along the bottom of the deepest ocean. How can your eyes just be your eyes? Not all these preferences from the, the eyes of the earth, from the highest peak, the eyes of the ocean, from its greatest depth, not your eyes, the eyes of the earth from the highest peak, the eyes of the ocean from deep as you can go. And if your eyes are the eyes and ears and body of the ocean and the earth, then time is not happening to you. And as soon as your personal eyes and ears become your only reference point, time is happening. And there is a you separate from time, arrayed quite amazingly in linear time, struggling to live outside of being, that's our life as it is. You know, in the Heart Sutra, when those lines that say no eyes, no ears, no tongue, it's saying the eye of the earth and the ocean from the top of the highest peak proceed along the bottom of the deepest ocean. That eye is not constrained by these. You know, maybe dukkha or suffering or discontent it's just this gap uh, between being and, and time. Whenever it's your life, my life, not the life of the earth, not the life of the ocean. Whenever we're suffering, Dogen might be suggesting there, there's this gap. As, to, as opposed to thinking about um, suffering or craving or wanting or as aversion or habits of conditioning, could it have something to do with our experience of time? And this is what we're going to investigate. You know that famous teaching of Dogen about dropping body and mind? I think he's suggesting that this is the enactment of kinship with all beings and all being with the earth and with the oceans. It's the enactment of impermanence in which we don't lose our self-identity. You still remember where that is. 
but we drop our clinging to a particular self-identity and take our place on the top of the highest mountain and at the bottom of the deepest ocean. For example, um, right now it's, what is it, it's 7.36 a.m. here, but I know that in the central United States it's nearly noon, and in the UK and in Switzerland it's much later in the evening. Maybe you've been here since early morning, and maybe, or maybe you just lost track of time. I get confused with the time zones, <laughs> with all these difference calculating all the time. So what time is it really? Which, which is the real time? Or maybe you're just impatient, you know, resisting the moment, hanging out just outside of embodied immediacy, disconnected, dissatisfied, Come on, get on with it, you know? But when you're presencing, being and time are not distinct. Your heart and mind are not obstructed. You are not here. Here is you now. One translation of Uji is come closer. Come closer to the parts of you which have been locked up. Come closer for a while. Uji is naked time. Yesterday's time and today's time never leave, and they're always leaving. Therefore, awakening energy and shadow energy arrive at the same time. And darkenment and enlightenment arise in this dance called awakening at the same time. Being time. And delusions don't go away. They're swallowed by time and being. And realization is actualized by imperfect beings like us realizing imperfection perfectly for the time being. And if you can't accept that delusions in yourself and that they don't go away, you're going to project them onto others when you meet in groups. We all want to go around actualizing our better sides to others. And this is natural and it's incompleteness, not purification, not refinement. That's not our practice. It's not awakening. But the time being swallows up what we think of as the good stuff and the bad stuff. The perfect relationship which you adored and the time you got your heart broken. For the time being, three heads and eight arms were all over the place. For the time being, an eight or 16 foot body, beautiful upright Buddha, maybe just a whisk or a staff, a pillar or a lantern. Zhang and Li, that's like Jones and Smith, just an ordinary person. For the time being, the earth and the sky. So I see that we're probably at a time now where we can be together in our small groups. And this may be a little unusual or flowing way to enter, but I wanted to, I wanted to immerse us in a feeling of what this is, a, a feeling of, of penetrating these teachings. And now in your small groups, you have some time just to meet each other. What if you don't hold some intention about how it needs to go? but you can presence in time with each other, look in the face, see another as a Buddha, which calls forward your Buddha. Standing on the highest peak, having the biggest view, going the deepest ocean, realizing your imperfection as the beauty of this, this moment. And following that, you'll be prompted, of course, to have our um, 
breakfast, lunch, or dinner break because all of these things are different times. <laughs> but please enjoy your time together. And thank you, thank you, thank you for coming and thank you for uh, allowing me to uh, uh, launch us in this unusual way.